Welcome back to our estate planning webinar series. I'm Lisa Peters and I'm joined by my colleague, Zach Mangles. In our introduction, we defined estate planning. Most people understand estate planning directs assets at death, but there's much more, including naming important individuals to take on decisions if you're incapacitated. Zach, would you mind elaborating more on the risks of not having an estate plan? Yeah, certainly. And hopefully this will serve as additional motivation for anybody watching this video and who doesn't already have an estate plan in place. So what are the risks of not having an estate plan? I think basically without it, decisions about your medical care, your property, your assets, uh, and even the, your final arrangements are going to be made without your input. So medical decisions will fall to the treating doctor or the hospital. Your property and your assets will be divided and distributed at death according to state law. And your final arrangements might be carried out according to the whims of a relative or in accordance to local customs. And then, of course, if you have children who are minors, they may end up um, being taken care of by, the, by guardians who you wouldn't have chosen yourself. So effectively, in all instances without an estate plan, uh, things might not go the way that you would like them to go and your survivors could be left to deal with the ramifications. And I think as it is, when somebody's passing away, it's already a very emotional time for the survivors. And if you layer on top of this, this idea that they need to make some decisions on behalf of their loved one, that maybe they, they aren't sure that the loved one would make themselves, um, it, can, it can make it an even more stressful and an even more emotional time. Um, I've personally found that the clients that I have who are most adamant about having an estate plan in place are the ones who've been involved in the passing of a loved one who didn't have an estate plan themselves. So now that we know a little bit about what can go wrong without an estate plan, let's talk about the elements that are common to all estate plans. And so there's five documents that you'll find. You have the financial power of attorney, the medical power of attorney, advanced healthcare directive or living will. Then you'll have a will and a revocable living trust. So I'm gonna dive into each of these in a little bit of detail and explain them. We're gonna start off with the financial durable power of attorney. So this document sets who makes financial decisions on your behalf should you become unable to do so yourself. Many people will name their spouse, their parent, a sibling, adult children, close friends. You can really name anybody to fulfill this role for you. There's a couple of terms I think are important for this document. Um, you've heard me say the word durable already. Durable means that this document and the powers that it authorizes this named individual will last through your own disability. So you put it in place now, you become disabled, this financial power of attorney is still in effect. It does stop though when you pass away. Another feature uh, or term to know is the, is, is the term called springing. And these powers of attorney, both the financial and the medical one, um, they can be made either immediate or springing. Immediate means that they're effective right away. You sign on the dotted line and whoever you've named has that has the power uh, to act as your financial or medical power of attorney right away. Springing means that a certain condition needs to be met. And typically that condition is the signature of, of two different doctors. Um, I've heard different attorneys come, on, come down on either side of this. More attorneys I find suggest making the power immediate rather than springing. And I think that the, the, the rationale is, you know, if you are willing to have somebody make financial decisions for you while you're incapacitated or unable to do those yourself, you'll probably also feel comfortable with them having that power while you are capable. Um, not giving advice on this, this is just what I've heard from estate attorneys. The second document is the medical power of attorney. And this sets who is gonna make medical decisions on your behalf, should you become unable to do so. And like I already said, those concepts of durable and springing apply to this as well. The third document is the advanced healthcare directive. Some states call this the living will. And this sets the conditions under which you do or don't want life-sustaining treatment. Um, this is also where you can specify funeral arrangements, organ donation, things of that nature, all, all found in the Advanced Healthcare Directive. The fourth document is the will, 
and the will directs how assets in your estate are distributed after you pass away. Um, you can give money to any individual or charity that you want, and you can even control the, the manner in which they get access to, these, to, to your assets. You can direct how debts are paid, how taxes are paid, and if you have a pet, you can even name somebody to care for the pet. Of course, uh, if you have minor children, this is also going to be the area where guardians are named. Uh, one of the things that I think is most important to talk about for the will, especially as it compares to the trust, is that the will is probated in court. And probate is a legal process that manages the distribution of assets and liabilities left behind by somebody who's recently passed away. And Lisa and I will both come back to that, to this topic of probate in, in a minute here. The fifth document is the living trust, and this directs how assets that are a part of the trust are distributed after you pass away. I think the easiest way to think about a trust or a living trust is just to think of it as an extension of you um, or like your own personal company or LLC. You're the CEO of your trust, but other people can become the CEO if you're unable to be. So, uh, one of the questions clients ask me is, you know, if I have a living trust and I put assets in there, are they taxed any differently? Um, that's not the case with trust. Like I said, literally just think of it as an extension of you. It's just, it's kind of a wrapper around all of your assets that governs how they are passed along to heirs if you, if you pass away. A couple of terms to know, the word revocable, you'll see frequently accompanying living trust. And it means exactly what it sounds like. It, you can revoke this trust at any time. You can change the terms. And revocable would be in contrast with the, with, the, with the term irrevocable. So there's an irrevocable trust, which when you think about a trust fund, those are quintessentially irrevocable trusts, whereas a living trust is completely revocable, changeable at any time. And uh, one of the key things, again, that differentiates it from the will is that the living trust does not go through probate. The assets are distributed by the trustee of the trust. So Lisa, you and I both live in different states and each of our states has a different view on how they use the will and the trust. So maybe you could spend some, a little time talking about how it's handled in Washington. Yes, in Washington state, we're not, it's not as frequently used, the revocable living trust um, as just the plain standard will. Our pro probate process is much less burdensome and, and expensive. And so rather than having the revocable trust that avoids probating assets, Wills are typically sufficient as long as all the property you own is in the state. And if you own property outside the state of Washington, there could be other considerations. Your attorney might, might recommend a revo revocable living trust. One other important difference is that Washington state has a much lower threshold for paying estate taxes um, than, than California or the federal level. And we'll talk more about that in part four. How do uh, wills and trusts work in California? Uh, so in California, the probate process, that, that court process that wills go through, is known to be extremely slow and very expensive. And it's also a public thing. So you can, you can read, the, read how the estate is distributed. It's public knowledge, or but the public has access to it. The trust, like I said already, overcomes these issues, and the estate can actually be distributed much more quickly at a fraction of the cost and in private. So wills are still used in California um, and their, their primary purpose, aside from, my, from naming guardians, I would say that's a very important role for the will, um, but its primary purpose is to, is to pour over or to transfer assets into the trust that uh, the, that the uh, person forgot to do so. So in the state of California, you'll often hear of the will referred to as a pour over will because it's pouring over all of the assets into the trust. Great, thanks. I'd like to mention an important topic that we sometimes forget about, and that is because we're in the age of digital assets. We have social media accounts, we might have documents online. It's very important to ensure that your executor or trustee is specifically directed on what to do with your online information and passwords to access them. Um, I'm sure others have encountered this who've settled estates, but I had a client whose twin brother passed away unexpectedly. He had an estate plan, but he did not really reference anything in the way of passwords or online accounts. And so unfortunately, 
my client couldn't access information to let his um, contacts know about his passing. So it highlights a really important area. We wanted to comment here about some elements of the estate plan that are frequently misunderstood. There are certain assets that have beneficiary designations, retirement plans like 401ks, 403bs, deferred compensation, life insurance, annuities. The disposition of these assets is not governed by the will or the revocable trust. These assets will flow directly to individuals or charities via the beneficiary feature. Similarly, accounts that are titled in the name of joint tenants with rights or survivorship or transfer on death accounts also pass via beneficiary designation. Now you can name your estate or a trust as a beneficiary of one of these accounts and that account will then flow into your broader estate plan. Your attorney will review and recommend what beneficiary designation should be named as part of your overall estate plan. There are also some uh, additional supplemental estate planning resources we find very helpful. And these aren't legally binding documents. We have another webinar titled Sharing Your Financial Values with Your Family that highlights a couple of these documents. So I'll just mention them briefly here. The first is a financial inventory. This is a summary of the family property, a one-stop depository of information where family members can find everything. Location of documents, online passwords, professional contacts, healthcare providers, and those monthly subscriptions that might be an auto pay that might need to be stopped. There could be information about alarm codes, outstanding debts, or money owed. So it's a one-stop place to basically uh, pre prevent your family members from having to do a stressful treasure hunt and finding all the details of your financial life. The second is a letter to family and friends, and this gives details about what you'd like your financial arrangements and services to look like. It might include organ don donation and, and can include references for caring for a pet and distributing things of sentimental value. And lastly, an ethical will is a template in which you could share family values, expectations for your children or grandchildren. It can give your family greater incense, insights as to why you assembled the estate plan that you have. It's not unusual to have property passing to children, maybe not equally, but certainly um, equitably. Please reach out to me, your advisor, or Zach, if you'd like a copy of these resources. Um, I'd also like to quickly plug the ethical will, too. I think it's a great document. You know, you'll find that your primary estate documents, the five ones that I talked about earlier, are full of legalese. So not only does that mean that it's hard to read, but for your, for your family, um, it can also feel really cold. And it doesn't provide any context for the decisions that you've made. And I think that that's where the ethical will comes in. Um, my mom passed away when I was 19 and she wrote letters to myself and my brother that we still have. Um, and you know, it's one of the most important things that, that we carry with us. Um, and she also, uh, next to all of her or with all of her jewelry, she hand wrote, um, how she got it, why it was important to her, um, what she wants us to do with it and things like that. And it just provided a level of insight into what my mom was thinking that we would have never otherwise had. So I'm a huge proponent of ethical wills for anybody to use. Um, so that brings us to the end of the, our first part on uh, estate planning. We've talked about the five basic documents that make up an estate plan. We talked about the kind of assets that transfer outside of those five basic documents. And then we reviewed three supplemental documents um, that can also help round out the estate plan and which we can provide to you if you'd like those. Uh, so we hope you've enjoyed this overview on estate planning. Please stay tuned to our next section where Lisa and I discuss the questions that we hear most frequently from our clients.